about politics. Everybody is talking about politics. You get really crazy about it. Even if you open Facebook, it's all about this party and that party. And um, people are not being honest also because there was a strike last week. And, uh, and I saw pictures from another, another newslet on Facebook and they showed pictures and you saw just a few people. And I was, I was deceived by it. I, I, like, I was like, everybody was talking. It was like a, a big march. And I saw only a few people. But what did they do? They posted pictures of 9 o'clock in the morning that it was just starting. You see? And then luckily, Facebook, you can reply also. So many people posted pictures of how many people there actually are. But the reason I tell you this is because politics is just a dirty game. It's just he blames him, he blames his, and, and, and we are the best, and he is wrong. It's just one big game. But we are Christians. And we are in the middle of this country and in, in the middle of this election. Should we be involved in politics? So I think the Bible has the answer. So the, the title of my sermon is, Thou shalt not follow a multitude. Thou shalt not follow a multitude. It comes from Exodus 23, 2. Let, let's pray. <clears throat> Exodus 23, 2. It says here, <clears throat> like the title of the sermon, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. I must admit the first part was, was easier to understand. It says thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. A multitude is a lot of people. So if you are marching and striking and you go out, you follow a multitude. And you might say, yeah, but I don't do evil. Well, maybe not willingly, but unwillingly. Because if you go out you are uh, provoking somebody because you are waving a certain flag with a certain color and somebody else is waving another flag with another color. So you, you, you um, are making actions and reactions. Some people will react uh, not according to what you wish for. So that's what the Bible says. But the last part, I have to admit, I had to read it ten times to understand it. It says here, Neither shalt thou speak in a cause, that means you, you shall not speak in a way, to decline after many to rest judgment. That means you will not speak in a way that you decline, reject the opinion of others. Just to put your own judgment in, in first place. Rest comes from wrestling. You fight with many just to put your own judgment first. You don't want, want to listen to anybody because you think you have the best party. And you have to understand this. Because no party is perfect. Maybe you have a great political party, but they have flaws also. They have many problems also. So don't, don't say, I follow a purple flag. And just because of that, I don't listen to any other people. That's just foolishness. And that's what the Bible says. Decline after many. Meaning you reject a lot of people just to, to push your own judgment in front. And that's, of course, that's not good. So um, you, for, don't force your beliefs. And what does the Bible uh, otherwise say? John 7.24. You can go there. <clears throat> This is very important to understand what the Bible says. And then I hope at the end of this sermon, you understand how we should um, deal with politics. In John 7, 24, it says here, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. This is what God says. He says, do not judge according to appearance. Many people think it's only about physical looks and whatever. But appearance can also how a political party portrays himself. Because they all talk highly about themselves. I'm not, I'm not for any political party. So let that be clear. I'm not standing here, I have this color or this. I don't care at all. I voted for Jesus a long time ago or a while ago. So that's my only political party. But, um, so don't look at all the things that they say. Because they want to appear like we are the best and we're going to save everybody, we're going to get out of this crisis and we can do this. But that's just <clears throat> the appearance. Don't judge according to the appearance, the Bible says. Judge righteous judgment. And don't let anyone tell you, judge not. You, you as Christians, you cannot judge. That's the, the favorite sentence of people, right? Judge not, judge not. Everything you say, judge not. Well, that's from Matthew 7, and that's only the first two words. Read the whole chapter. Have you ever read a book, and then only the first two words, and then you know the whole book? No, but according to many people say, judge not, and let's not read the rest. Well, if you read the rest, then you see clearly that it says you can judge, but judge righteous. So if you drink, don't tell somebody you should not drink, because you drink yourself. That, that's what the Bible says. But if you don't drink, you, of course you can say, hey, please, don't drink. 
judge righteous judgment, the Bible says. And um, I don't want to defend the president, and I don't want to attack the president, because I don't know the guy. I never met the guy. I don't know if he's a good man or a bad man, but people are pointing the finger to one person. The president, all the president's fault, everything. The wash machine breaks, all oh, it's the president's fault. I'm going to trip over a rock, yeah, about a, about a schuld, right? President's fault, everything is president's fault. I even, people don't want to accept Jesus because it's the president's fault. And it seems like a joke, but it's actually true. I come to people with the Bible and about being saved, and they say, yeah, but politics and the, and the president. I'm not talking about the president, I'm talking about your soul going to heaven. But that's, everything is pointing to one man, but that's not fair. I don't know who he is, but it's not fair to point one finger to one person because he, he doesn't uh, have his party alone. Let's see in Proverbs. Proverbs 13, 20. Proverbs 13, 20. <clears throat> it's too easy to say, ah, it's all the president. Every, every fault in your life is the president's fault. <laughs> it's way too easy. Proverbs 13, 20. Yes, it says here, He that walketh with wise men, shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. I mean, do you think that he has only wise men uh, around himself? The president has a lot of people around himself that are fools or greedy or maybe evil. So he has many people around him, and because of that pressure, he has to make certain decisions that are not popular. You know, maybe some, some things he doesn't want to do because of the pressure of the companion of people around him, he has to do certain things. I don't know, but it's too easy to say it's just the president's fault. Because what happened with God and Lucifer? Lucifer was, the, was the greatest, one of the greatest angels of God. He was a great angel. He has everything he needed, every riches, wealth, whatever. But what did he say? He said literally, he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer said, I will be like the Most High. He didn't say, I want to be the Most High. Like. He knew that he could not be God. That, that's clear. But he wanted to be like the Most High. That means he wants the same worship, the same uh, power, the same dominion. Don't you think that a president of a country, not even talk about this country, but every country in the world, don't you think that he has, there are leaders that have people around them that want to be like the president? They know they cannot be the president but they want to be like the president. And the same problem has this president, every president in the world. Because people are around him just because his uh, stature, his power, his uh, influence on the country. So how can you know who your real friends are? It's a really um, disgusting job and I, I never want to be something like that. I, I would never wish to be a president. But there are people that, that have that, that goal, but there are false reasons for that. Uh, so again, um, don't judge according to the appearance. This is very important because you have to look about politics. There are many things going on behind the scenes. I'm going to have two examples of things that are happening in politics all over the world in history. And those two, they meant many things, but I want to show you that you cannot judge according to the appearance. One of the things is a shadow government. There's something called a shadow government. What does that mean? That means there are people behind a political leader that actually tell the president what to do. So the president is in front of the people and it seems that he is in control, but there's a shadow government, meaning people in the shadow that actually run the country. I'm not saying that this is this country. I have no idea. But this is happening all over the world. And I'm going to prove that to you. Um, and Christians should believe in a shadow government. Why? Let's go to Ephesians 6.12. You can use this verse a lot of times. I like this verse, especially in this time. Ephesians 6.12. If you say a shadow government that's from movies, that's from television, I don't believe in that. Well, as Christians, we should believe in that. Because Ephesians 6.12, what does it say? Everybody knows this verse. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of what? Of the darkness. Shadow. There's an in the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places, meaning political places, uh, um, whatever. So anyway, did, the Bible already talks that there are powers behind some people that actually rule the country. And this is what's happening right now. And I'm going to uh, show that. I got some pictures. I can only show this with pictures because it's just too impact. Same, same uh, thing. <clears throat> uh, 
the number one superpower in the, con of in the world is uh, the United States, of course. They proclaimed themselves a superpower. When they defeated Russia, the Soviet Union, they said, we are now the number one superpower because it was Russia and the United States. There was a battle between those two. And then, of course, they won this battle. And now the United States is the number one superpower. And it has also a president, as the, at this moment, President Trump. Um, this is really weird. I saw this interview a lot of times. You can go to the picture one. <clears throat> there was an interview on CNN. This was not from some weird website. CNN had an interview with the attorney of President Trump, his attorney, and his name was Alan Pomerantz. This was just, you can look this up, Alan Pomerantz of Attorney Trump. And this is what he said, what the attorney said. I, I wrote it down. We made the decision that he, meaning President Trump, would be more, uh, sorry, would be worth more alive to us than dead. Dead meaning in bankruptcy. We don't want him in bankruptcy, but out in the world selling these assets for us. Look at this. We kept him alive to help us. This is what his attorney said. We, meaning many people, kept him, the president, alive to help us. Doesn't that tell you that there is a shadow government? How can you say something about the one leader? If he actually was in charge, would, would you let somebody talk to you like that? But President Trump had, uh, was in bankruptcy and he had uh, debt in 72 uh, banks. He had a gamble addiction and everything, but he's a good businessman. So they put him in front and he said, I want, them, uh, I want him to sell our stuff. But there are people behind him that actually call the shots. If you think this is far reaching, just look it up. Just look it up. This is, this is just on, on CNN. This is not a big secret. And there is another thing, um, we, we talked about a shadow government, so again, don't judge according to the appearance. And there's another thing, it's called controlled opposition. Controlled opposition, what is this thing? This happens for a long time. It says here, um, if you, for example, have a political party, let's say you have Faith Baptist political party, I'm just making an example. And now you have this party and people are voting and whatever. But you don't know for sure who your enemies are. So what are you going to do? You're going to start another political party, and that is Works Baptist Party. I, I'm just making up names, you know? So now you've got another political party, but you actually put a leader there. You, you pay the leader to be your opposition. And that's what they call in this country also the opposition. So, so now you control both. And now you know exactly everybody who is against you joins that party. But you pay this party, so you know exactly what's going on in the party. So when there is a big strike and this party goes on the street, you know exactly who your enemies are. It's smart, right? And if you think this is far-reaching, uh, look at this, picture two. I don't know if you know Lenin, Vladimir Lenin. He was uh, of the Soviet Union, a party uh, uh, head, and he was, he was the head of the Soviet Union. He served as head of the government of Soviet Russia from 1917 to 1924, and of the Soviet Union from 1922 to 90, uh, sorry, 1922 to 1924. So he was a big leader of Russia. And this is what he said. He says, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it yourself. This is what he said in 1922. Can you imagine? He says the best way is to control it yourself. So just start up another party, just act on television that you hate each other, and afterwards you drink a beer in a bar. This is happening all over the world. Do you think that he was the only one? Many people are still, many countries are still acting like this. Again, I'm not saying that this country acts like that, but it could be. That's why the Bible says don't judge according to the appearance. You don't know. You have no idea what's going on behind closed doors. And you going out uh, with a flag and, and fighting with people just for your political party. You have no idea. So if you do this, I'm not judging you, but look what the Bible says. You might think, how is that possible? Is that real? How do you know those secrets? Those, because they are secrets, right? Then how can you know the secrets? Well, the Bible says, first of all, seek and thou shalt find, right? Seek and thou shalt find. This is not only talking about your salvation. It's talking about everything. Seek and thou shalt find. But the other thing is from Luke, Luke 8, 17. And I always love when, when I prepared this, and this morning passed already uh, in Mark said the same verse. So that's, I believe that God is working. Luke 8, 17. Look what the Bible says. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, 
neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. It says it's impossible to have a secret. Everything will come to the light. Everything. It doesn't say specific things. It says anything. Uh, nothing is secret. And it says here, neither anything hid. That means if you seek for those things, you shall find. And you shall find. Just go on the internet. It has so many websites. You can find exactly what, you, what you're searching for. And if you're searching for these secrets, you can find them. A shadow government and a controlled opposition are real things. Search for it. I think it's very interesting. So if you vote, you vote. I'm not saying you should not vote. That's up to you and God. I, I don't know. I don't vote. And I said it before, I never voted in my life. And I will never vote in my life. I don't believe in that. I believe in selection, not in election. I believe this is already prepared. Like for instance, uh, it's a good example. If you got children and they, they don't want to go to bed, right? They don't want to go to sleep. So now you're going to give them an option. You say, okay, children, listen, you have to go to sleep, but I'm going to give you an option. You can go to sleep at 8 o'clock or at 10 o'clock. Choose. Well, what, what are they going to say? 10 o'clock. Yes, 10 o'clock. But at the end, you already decided that 10 o'clock is the maximum. They didn't even think about 11 and 12 because you gave them a choice. And they think that those two choices are the only ones. This is very sneaky. And that's what the, what the government does. If you look at the elections in... Um, I don't know when it was, the last elections when Trump was elected. You saw nine, eight, ten people, and you can choose between those ten. But what about the eleven or the twelve? Do you think that only those ten are, are capable to run a country? There are many options, many good people that could run the United States, but they give you ten options. Like, choose, and you are voting, and you're like, yeah, no, I think him, him, but at the end, they're all friends. If you research all of, the, of those candidates, they are all related. By even by blood, even the back cousin and whatever, it's crazy. Even the Hollywood actors, they're all related by blood. And uh, the, the, so it's one big joke. But they give you the illusion of choice, so you think that you have influence of the country. You, you actually don't have influence. The only one who has influence about a country is God himself. So don't, don't look to leaders, look to God himself. Look at this, this is just I want to show you. Uh, this is picture three. <clears throat> This was a picture way before the elections, because the last elections, it was Trump and Hillary, right? They, were be they are best friends. They are great friends. Their children come to each other's weddings. And if you look at interviews before the election, like 20 years back, they talk about each other like, I love those people. Trump said, I love the Clintons. Those are my best friends. And Hillary Clinton said, oh, I love Trump. He's such a smart man. They are friends. But what happened when the elections came? They were fighting with each other. Those two, yeah, you this and this. And what did Trump say? He said, when I become president, you will, uh, I will lock you up. You go behind bars. Well, he's president for a lot of years now. Well, is he still running around? You see? So look at the fruit. Not about what people say. That's, that's also what the Bible says. They are very good friends, by the way. I give you another example because I think it's, it's, it's funny to, to think about this. In uh, 2004... There was also an election, and I remember this. I was way younger, and it was the first time that I started to understand elections and presidents and whatever. And this was in 2004. You can go to picture four. This was President Bush, uh, George W. Bush, so son of uh, Father Bush, and John Kerry. Those two were fighting with each other, the whole country. I don't know if you remember, but this was bigger than Hillary and Trump. This was a big thing because, because they... Bush had a great name, of course, because his father also was president. And they were fighting with each other. They were fighting, and on every magazine there was like, Bush or Kerry, who's going to be? Well, look at this. There was an interview with both of them. And this is very interesting. Go to picture, next picture. Yes, there was an interview. This guy on the right is called uh, Timothy Russert. And he interviewed both of them. He interviewed George Bush. And he interviewed John Kerry. And he asked one question. And, and that was a very expensive question. He asked, you were both members of a secret society, Skull and Bones. What does that tell us? That's actually what he said. Look at it on YouTube. That's what he asked John Kerry and George Bush. What did they reply? Well, Kerry said, not much because it's a secret. Don't you just admit it that you are in a, in a secret society? Because if it's not true, you would say, well, what is this for craziness? He says, not much because it's a secret. Okay, then a week later, there was an interview with George Bush. 
Same question. Uh, are you in a secret society, Skull and Bones? And what did George Bush say? He said, uh, it's so secret, we cannot talk about it. I mean, you're admitting on live television. Both of them were in the same organization. That's from Harvard. That's a big school, by the way. Both of them were in the same secret society called Skull and Bones. You can go one further. This is a picture of Skull and Bones. This is a real organization. This is what's happening. This is the shadow government. Don't uh, judge according to the appearance because you don't know. And you know who's on the left side of the clock? That's the father of Bush. That's Father Bush. Look at it. So his father was also in Skull and Bones. His uncle, his grandpa, there's a whole tradition of family members. And both of the elections, and you, you vote on Kerry and some on Bush, it's the same. It's the illusion of choice. And again, I don't know if this is the same in this country. I have no idea. But I just tell you this, like, don't get involved in politics. Rather spend your hours in the Bible. Just follow God, because this, this is happening. By the way, this is just off track. But the guy that interviewed those two people, he died short after. A couple years after, he, he died. And I don't think it's a coincidence. He has a heart attack. But he died of the, of the age of 58. 8 and 5 is 13. And he died also on the 13th of June. And he died at a, a certain age. And you see they have a, a number, right? Oh, I, okay. The number of skull and bones is 322. I forgot that picture. 322 is their number. And he actually died at 223. So that's backwards. So this is just to, to add into. Uh, politics is a dirty game. And we as Christians have to go into the light. So that was a little bit off track. Um, what does also the Bible says? Again, don't judge according to the appearance. How should we deal with it? Jesus had an answer to deal with it. You can go to Matthew 22, 17. Jesus tells you exactly how to deal with leaders and political parties. It's a really dirty game, so don't, don't mess with, with that. Uh, Matthew 22, 17. Look at this. Are you there? 22, 17. <clears throat> okay, they asked Jesus a question. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Look what Jesus said. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? So putting somebody to a choice is, is wickedness. And it says in 19, Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose, whose is, is this image and this subscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the thing which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are of God. Jesus gave you the answer. Look, if there is a leader, you have to deal with it. But don't, don't get involved in that. Look at what is this picture? Caesar, give unto Caesar what is his, and give God what is his. Separation. Separate those two. It's clearly seen. So does that mean you should obey the government? Yes. You should pay your taxes. You should allow the, the laws. Everything, you should obey the government. Except if they get to your Bible. When they come to the point that they say you cannot go to church anymore or you cannot read the Bible, then you have to stand down. Because this, now you, you, you're going to God's place. It says clearly Caesar has his thing and God has his thing. Don't interfere. And this is what they call a separation of church and state. I think Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, he said there had to be a separation. Church and uh, politics don't match. And, and Pastor also, a couple of months back, he told about... Um, you cannot be involved in politics as a pastor because you will have to come to a choice that, that you have to choose between the Bible or the world. And you, you cannot do that because this choice will happen every day. So separate yourselves from that. You can go to um, Matthew 6.24. Matthew 6.24. We see the separation all over again. <clears throat> Matthew 6.24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. It's clearly, you cannot serve both. Make a decision what you're going to do. You're going to be in the world and, and waving flags and go left and right, or you're going to choose to serve God. I think it's a great separation. What is mammon? Mammon is, of course, dictionary, by the way, says, wealth regarded as an evil influence or false object, or worship and devotion. Mammon is, is worshiping money. People worship money. And that's, that's every time, if you want to be rich in the world, sell your soul and you will be rich. But you will lose your soul. Bible talks about it every time. So make a decision. Because this money 
It's an evil influencer. So if you are in politics, this money will influence you to not do what the Bible says. Very dangerous. So make a separation. Look at this, 1 Samuel 8.4. 1 Samuel 8.4. What, what, what was the best way? What is God's way? Is he happy about leaders? The Bible tells us about that. 1 Samuel 8.4. Three minutes, yeah? This was uh, when they got King Saul. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Is that not following a multitude? Exactly what the Bible says, follow like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they say, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. And look at this. This is what God says. For they have not rejected thee, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So what, what is this? Choosing a leader is actually rejecting God. We see that God said, look, I'm your leader. He's the king of kings, lord of lords. Who else do you need? But then the people, the same. They, we want the king like all the others. They follow the multitude. God is enough. In a perfect world, we don't have political parties. We have one ruler, and that's God. And he will never leave office. Never. <laughs> so, uh, what should you do? Make a decision. That's clear. In closing, I'm going to close with this one. Two minutes left. Um, let's go to Matthew 15, 14. Let's, let's sum this up. And now it's going to get crazier and crazier. Elections are almost... I believe everybody will talk about the politics. I mean, if I take a taxi cab, he, the whole conversation is about uh, the election, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. Well, you don't know what the real reason is. Matthew 15, 14. It says here, Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. It's clear. Look at the first sentence. Let them alone. Is that not separation? Let them follow each other. They are blind, and the followers are also blind, and they fall, both fall in a ditch. So if you follow the multitude, you fall in a ditch. Let them alone. To, to sum up, what did we see in this sermon? We see, first of all, do not follow a multitude, meaning separate yourself. We also so, see what we just saw, let them alone. That's a separation. You and them are different. We see Jesus said, give unto Caesar his, and God his. Again, we see a separation. And as last, you see... You cannot serve God and mammon. Again, a separation. So I think it's clear what the Bible says about politics. We go to the very last one, and that's the end of the sermon. 14, sorry, Proverbs 14.34. I used this uh, verse uh, before because we're in time of elections. Proverbs 14.34. Who can fix this country? Because this country needs to be fixed. But it's not that worse as, as you think. I mean, there are countries that have bigger problems. This country is not in that much trouble. And who can help you? Can you vote on purple, on yellow, or on orange? No. It says here, righteousness exalted a nation, and sin is a reproach to any people. So what does exalt this country? What does exalt Suriname? Righteousness. Our righteousness? No, God's righteousness. If you really want to help uh, this country, pray for this country. Pray for Suriname daily. Just say, God, fix this country. Put a leader in place that, that deserves us. You know, or otherwise around, that we deserve this leader. Pray for Suriname, bring the gospel. The more people that are saved, the more God will bless this country. I believe this, I believe this with all my heart. Don't, don't, don't you think if 80% of this country is saved, accepting Jesus, don't you think that this country is be blessed? So again, God will bless this country. Righteousness exalted the nation. So pray for Suriname.